One of the phrases I've used about zinc many times when I begin discussing it with my students is zinc has so many different faces. And just thinking about the biology of zinc, we consider it as a nutrient with many different phases. And so now you've heard more about the chemistry and physics as well, so uh, it's really an interesting element. At the top of this slide, you see this symbol, uh, iZinc. That stands for the International Zinc Nutrition Consultative Group, which is a group I started about 20 years ago. And you're going to hear a lot about the theme of this group's work dealing with international problems related to, in, to inadequate uh, zinc intakes. I have no conflicts of interest uh, to report, and you can see that my funding has come primarily from the NIH, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the Gates Foundation, and Harvest Plus. So zinc, as you've heard, it's an element. Uh, the number for it is 30. And it's one of 40 essential nutrients. Obviously, our body cannot manufacture and produce zinc. We are totally required to get the zinc we need from the food we eat. It is unique in that it is required for the structure and function of hundreds of different body components. It's not like vitamin A, that has a couple functions, primarily uh, enabling you to see well, preventing night blindness, or iron in order to prevent the development of anemia. Zinc has many different functions. You need to consume, as an adult, around 10 milligrams a day. But if you go to the drugstore and decide you want to get yourself a zinc supplement, and there are plenty to be had, you won't have to struggle to find them, you will see that practically all of them have 50 milligrams of zinc a day in them, about five times. You don't have to worry about taking five times what you really need, because zinc has a low toxicity level. However, I would not recommend ever taking 10 times the amount of any nutrient uh, over what is required. So taking two 50 milligrams, supplements of zinc may not be wise to do. So the discovery that zinc is essential for biology uh, was first made in 1926 when it was found that zinc is essential for the normal growth of plants, particularly green plants. If you have a garden with lettuce in it or spinach and you don't have enough zinc in the soil, the leaves will get very ragged and not lustrous in color. It was in 1934, about 20, uh, 80 years ago, three professors at the University of Wisconsin showed that zinc is essential for the, uh, for the life of rats. If they were deficient in zinc, uh, eventually they would die, and there would be many complications that developed before they died. This was a period of time, the 1930s, 1940s, and a little bit into the 1950s, when we really were at that phase of discovering what nutrients are essential. Some of that work was going on at Berkeley at that time. Vitamin E, for example, was discovered at Berkeley. Uh, but the other university that was very much involved in the discovery of the essentiality of nutrients was the University of Wisconsin. So it's not a surprise then that in 1955, some professors at the University of Wisconsin reported that zinc is essential to prevent parakeratosis and improve growth in swine. And here is a picture of a pig that was got an adequate amount of zinc, and this one got an inadequate amount of zinc. Notice that the growth is stunted, the hair on this pig is not lustrous like it is on this pig, and you can sort of see that the bones are not straight, but they're curved in nature. It wasn't until 1963 that Ananda Prasad who now is at Wayne State University in Michigan, 
uh, discovered that zinc is essential for humans. He went to Iran and later to Egypt at that particular time. He was a hematologist and was studying iron deficiency in children in Iran and Egypt. And he noticed that some of the children didn't have a normal iron deficiency anemia. So he tried to figure out what it was, and he found out that it was a zinc deficiency. This was primarily because the primary food they were eating was unleavened bread. Bread alone is not a good source of zinc, and often if it is unleavened, that zinc is not well absorbed. In Iran, some of the uh, boys were also eating dirt, which also had some zinc in the dirt. Zinc is everywhere in our atmosphere, but again, not well absorbed and used. So the primary symptoms that he observed in these adolescent boys was their stunted growth. These are boys ranging in age from 16 to 19 years of age, and this is their height in centimeters, and you see it is all, they are all stunted, and there is delayed sexual maturation. You may wonder why all of this work was done in boys and not in girls, and that is because Dr. Prasad told me that girls refused to be examined, but they probably were zinc deficient as well. So, as I said, zinc has many different functions. Uh, it's essential for maintaining the structure of compounds in that it can form a ligand or a bond with sulfur and nitrogen in protein. So zinc tends to travel with protein in your body. And what you can see here in this molecule is that there are some sulfur-containing amino acids, and here in the middle is a zinc compound that is holding it together. So it's structural. But it also is catalytic, and it's associated with many enzymes. And in that capacity, it accepts electrons and can activate an enzyme. So if zinc is not there, the enzyme does not function normally. And it also is involved in the control of metabolism in that it forms different linkages between compounds, particularly different hormones. It's very essential for the normal action of insulin and also for maintaining the integrity of our membranes. So it's crucial for many essential functions, some of which I've listed on this slide. As I said, it's involved in enzyme function and structure. And you see that it's also required for normal metabolism of protein, fat, and carbohydrate, your three major sources of energy in your diet. It also is required for the normal metabolism of alcohol. If that is another source of energy in your diet, you need zinc for that as well. So, so for protein and nucleic acid me metabolism, it's involved in the synthesis of DNA and RNA and the degradation of those compounds. For lipid metabolism, it's required for cholesterol transport, for essential fatty acid metabolism, lipid stability in the cell membranes. Carbohydrate metabolism is required for glucose tolerance because it's needed for the normal function of insulin. It's also needed for the normal function of the thyroid hormones, growth hormone, and corticosteroids. And immune function is another function that is very demanding for zinc. It appears that probably maintaining normal immune function requires more zinc on a daily basis than all of the other functions put together. So this is the reason why people who are zinc deficient are very prone to infections and that can become a major cause of death. So we know that when zinc is deficient in the diet, the thymus gland does not develop normally. So here is a normal thymus gland. And we also know that when zinc is deficient in the diet, the bone marrow lacks zinc. We know that the bone marrow stimulates the thymus gland to produce and then release T cells. And if zinc is low, 
the thymus gets smaller and it leads to uh, smaller T cells that are very essential for normal immune function that are weak and don't carry out the functions normally. So this leads to an increase then in the susceptibility of infections. Another major function for zinc is for, to sustain growth. And that is because about 85% uh, percent of your body zinc is found in your muscle and in your bone. When you grow, you're gaining primarily muscle and bone, and therefore you need zinc to maintain a normal rate of growth. You see that the other organ tissues have much smaller amounts of zinc, although we certainly know that if zinc is low in the diet, brain function is impaired, neurocognitive development is impaired, and certainly liver function does not go well either. Note that 0.1% of your total body zinc is all that is found in blood. And for doing human studies, blood is what we can analyze most easily most people don't want us to do a muscle biopsy or a bone biopsy, so we have to rely on blood, but unfortunately there's very little zinc in blood and it doesn't reflect zinc status very well. So when a child is growing and gaining about 100 grams, or three, which is approximately three ounces, 15 milligrams of zinc needs to be deposited in the body in order to sustain that rate of growth. A child maybe would be eating five milligrams at most, maybe four milligrams of zinc a day, absorbs about 30%. So you see it takes a while for the child to accumulate that much zinc to maintain normal growth. Now, worldwide, we find that there is quite a wide variation in the percent of the population that is on low intakes of absorbable zinc. And I'll get back to why I'm calling that absorbable zinc in a little bit. In the United States, zinc deficiency is very rare, um, less than about one or two percent. But you see, as we go to other countries, the percent of the population that is uh, having a low intake of absorbable zinc is increasing. And when we get to uh, Southeast Asia, North Africa, and South Asia, you see that it rises to about 70 to 90 percent of the population is subsisting on a low zinc intake. So it is a prevalent problem worldwide. Why is that so? Well, the foods that are rich in zinc are primarily, where zinc is located, in the animal products that we are eating, the muscle. So it travels with protein in your diet. The best source of zinc in your diet is oysters. Oysters, you only have to eat three oysters and you'll get 74 milligrams of zinc a day about seven to eight times what you really need in that one small serving of oysters. Another good source of zinc is shellfish. Lobster, crabs, uh, are very, uh, shrimp are very good sources of zinc, as well as the mussel, red meat. White fish and also the dark meat of chicken is a good source, not as rich in zinc as the red meat, but uh, providing about three milligrams of zinc per serving. In the United States, if you go to the grocery store and look at all the different breakfast cereals, you will see that there are a lot of cereals that are fortified with zinc. Total is an example. And in the United States, the food item that provides the most zinc in the diet is fortified breakfast cereals. It's not the red meat or the shellfish or oysters, it's the fortified cereals. Beans and nuts are reasonable sources. Zinc needs to be there in order for the seed to grow and produce a plant. So that's why these foods are good sources of zinc. And dairy foods are reasonably good. Growing animals and, and also infants definitely need zinc in order to grow. 
And so dairy foods all provide zinc, but because it's fairly high in water, the concentration is reduced to about a milligram per serving. So those of us living in the United States, consuming a Western-based diet, get about half of our zinc in the diet from meat, fish, and poultry. Dairy foods, around 19 to 20%. Grain products, here 13%. Legumes and nuts, 5%, and vegetables, about 7%. So on an average, uh, we consume around 10 to 13 milligrams of zinc a day as an adult, and we absorb about 30% of what we consume. And that's because the phytate to zinc ratio in our diet is less than 15. So you might be saying, well, what's phytate? Well, phytate is the storage form for phosphorus in plants. And you see it's a six carbon ring, and at the end of each carbon there is a phosphate group. And that's how plants store phosphate in the grain. What happens is that these hydroxyl groups here are negatively charged, and they can release their hydrogen and pick up the zinc and bind the zinc to that uh, phosphate group. This is a large insoluble compound and is not easily absorbed. And so people who are living on grain-based diets and consuming a lot of phytate from the grains are getting zinc there, a little bit in the grain as well, but that zinc then gets bound to the phosphate on the inositol ring and is not available for absorption or, is, uh, or its absorption is greatly reduced. So when we go to the lower income countries in the world, we find that the population, uh, about 70% of the population are getting their zinc from cereals. 15% uh, uh, they, they get 15 percent of their zinc from legumes, a little bit from animal foods, and then other sources. And here the phytate then is higher, so it is a ratio of greater than 20, and this severely reduces the ability to absorb zinc. So out of the 7 billion people approximately in the world, we know that about 2 billion people worldwide are not absorbing enough zinc daily to meet their needs. Here is a chart showing the worldwide data. Each little dot on this chart represents a country worldwide. And it's looking at the prevalence of inadequate zinc intakes related to the prevalence of stunting. And you see, as the prevalence of inadequate zinc intakes goes up to above 25%, there is a marked increase in the prevalence of stunting. And there's a linear relationship between the prevalence of inadequate zinc intakes and stunting. Those of us living in Western countries are down here in this little square, where our prevalence of inadequate intakes are below 20 and the prevalence of stunting is below 10. The low-income countries where the 2 billion people are that are on low zinc intakes are up in this square, and you see that the prevalence of stunting is very high. But right here, we have also people who aren't reporting such low intakes of zinc, but also a high prevalence of stunting. And that's because the impact of phytate on zinc absorption is not considered in this particular uh, uh, slide. So let me tell you a little bit about my research. Given that zinc is a serious problem worldwide, I decided I wanted to try to find a good biomarker for zinc deficiency so that I could determine who is at risk of zinc deficiency and to assess the efficacy or the impact of potential ways to intervene and prevent zinc deficiency. 
And I decided that the biomarker for um, uh, identifying uh, zinc nutrition needs to be something that is specific for zinc, not influenced by protein or iron or another nutrient, sensitive to small changes in your intake, and a field-friendly assay that I could take to Vietnam or Bangladesh or Ethiopia or any of the countries where I'm currently working to begin to figure out the prevalence of zinc deficiency in those countries. The first thing that I realized, though, was that I had a big challenge, and that was how to measure accurately small amounts of zinc in blood, urine, and stools, the three things that I could assay. And the quantities of zinc in blood, urine, and stools ranges from about 0.5 to five milligrams. Just to put that in perspective for you, if you take a teaspoon of salt, that weighs about 5,000 milligrams. So see, this is a very small quantity that I'm trying to adequately measure. Ron told you about zinc being in the atmosphere, and this is a problem in the laboratory too. We have to be very careful that we don't contaminate our samples with zinc that's just floating around in the atmosphere atmosphere or in dirt that might be on the floor. So we have to do all of our analyses in these little tents. So one day, I, as a new assistant professor at Berkeley, I was discussing this problem with the department chair. And I said, Shelley, I just don't know how I'm going to figure out how to measure zinc in such small quantities in order to accomplish my goals. And he said, well, you know, I was reading something about some stable isotopes of phosphorus the other night. I wonder if there are any stable isotopes of zinc. Believe it or not, I had a handbook of chemistry in my office. So I went up to my office, and I looked. And as you've heard from Ron already, there are five isotopes of zinc, and then also zinc-65, uh, which is the major uh, radioactive isotope. And two of them are quite low in abundance. So it occurred to me, maybe I could use them as tracers. But I didn't have any equipment in the lab that would enable me to measure zinc-70 or zinc-67. So I decided I was going to have to form a collaboration with the chemistry department. Now, some of you may have been on the Berkeley campus and know that it's very hierarchical and how disciplines are organized on the campus. So chemistry and the physical sciences are at the top of the hill, and those of us in biology are at the bottom of the hill. So I remember the day vividly as I had to walk from the bottom of the hill up to the top of the hill to talk to a chemistry professor to see if he would help me measure um, these stable isotopes of zinc. He readily agreed to do it, uh, teamed me up with one of his um, new graduate students, Chris Can who I worked with for many years, and Chris, by the way, went on and used stable isotopes of calcium to measure bone loss in our astronauts in space. So I had a, a career with stable isotopes as well. In our first study, we used zinc-70 as an oral tracer, and we measured the appearance of zinc-70 in the stools to determine the amount of zinc that was absorbed. Later, we gave two isotopes, zinc-70 and 67, and we are now in the process of doing a study with 68 as well. And we gave the 70 orally and the 67 uh, intravenously and measured then uh, the amount in stools, blood, and urine. This is where I did the studies. On the Berkeley campus in the nutrition department, we had a penthouse, a four bedroom or three bedroom apartment on the top of the, um, of the Morgan Hall which in years past, uh, women going through that major had to learn how to keep house. So they had to stay in that place for a while and learn how to cook and clean and all those things. But anyway, we recruited men, uh, healthy men, uh, to come and live in our penthouse. We gave them a controlled diet. They couldn't eat anything but what we gave them to eat and drink. We did complete urine and fecal collections. 
We also did integumental collections because we knew zinc was being lost in old skin cells as well as in sweat. So they had to wear cotton suits for three days and then we gave them a quantitative bath and quantitatively washed the suits. We controlled their physical activity on a daily basis by taking them for walks or putting them on the treadmill for an hour. And they were required to stay there without leaving uh, for various periods of time, usually from four to 16 weeks, depending upon the uh, design of the study. So the first study we did was to uh, determine what was the effect of taking zinc out of the diet completely. Remember, these are the first human studies of zinc deficiency. So we started at the very basic level. We wanted to take all the zinc out of the diet. Well, the only way we could do that was to put together a formula diet based on egg whites with some sugar and some cornstarch and some oil. And if we did it that way, we could get the zinc level of the diet down to three-tenths of a milligram. We gave them all the vitamins and minerals that they needed except for zinc. And we had to give them a few zinc-free foods to chew from time to time uh, to satisfy their desire to chew. So they got a lot of carrot sticks and celery sticks, but they got pretty sick of that after a while as well. After having done several of these studies, we put together this kinetic model for zinc metabolism. We knew that the whole body contained about 1,500 milligrams of zinc. We knew that there was a pool of zinc that seemed to turn over more rapidly than the other tissue zinc, and this represented about 10% of the whole body. As I said, we gave zinc 67 with the diet, and we measured the amount absorbed by looking at the amount in the diet and, sub and subtracting from that that appeared in the stools. And then we uh, infused zinc 70, and from that we were able to measure the endogenous secretion of zinc back into the gut, which is the main way we get rid of excess zinc. It's not in the urine, it comes back into the gut through endogenous excretions. And looking at the ratio of 67 to 70 zinc, we were able to figure that out. And also, by the dilution of the 70 zinc, we were able to measure the size of this exchangeable zinc pool. And it represents about 10% of our whole body zinc, about 150 milligrams. Urine is very low in zinc, and the integumental losses are like that of the urine. <coughs> so we then uh, looked at the data from our severely low uh, zinc diet, and we measured the amount that was lost in the stools and in the urine. When they started out, they were losing about 10 milligrams a day that way. After two weeks on the diet, that had dropped to four-tenths of a milligram a day, virtually not losing any zinc from the body uh, when the diet was extremely low. But what surprised me was, even though they weren't losing the zinc from, the, uh, from their body, plasma zincs went down significantly, as you can see here, uh, during the uh, zinc depletion period. And so then we realized this was much more complicated than what we thought. So I learned that there was a technique called compartmental modeling, when you could take all of these data from your studies and put it together in a mathematical model. And then you can calculate the size of the different parts of the model and the rate of transfer of the zinc going from one section to the other. So we modeled the GI tract, we also had the plasma, we put the IV tracer in there, we put the oral tracer in the diet, and we looked at all, all of these exchanges. And the exchangeable zinc pool was these pink ones, and then, which makes up about 10% of the body zinc. This very slowly turning over pool was the rest of the body zinc. And what we found was that when the dietary zinc was low, like it was in this study, 
the size of these pools decreased. And it wasn't going because it was going out in the urine and feces. Remember, that was very low. Instead, it was being sequestered in this very slow turning over pool. The body has a tremendous capacity to hang on to zinc. It just seems like it knows that it is so essential. So it sequesters zinc when the zinc intakes are low. We call this then a type 2 nutrient. So what is a type 2 nutrient? A type 1 nutrient is what most, this is the way most of our nutrients behave. When it is low in the diet, the individual continues to grow, but that eventually has to use up the reserves, and then finally maybe have some decrease in body functions, and then maybe eventually there'll be a reduction in growth. So practically all of our nutrients behave that way. When iron is low, the child will continue to grow, but maybe first there'll be a decrease in serum iron, and then there'll be a decrease in hemoglobin levels. Vitamin A, folate, they all tend to behave that way. Zinc isn't like that at all, so we call it a type 2 nutrient. The first thing that happens when zinc is low in the diet is growth stops. The body does everything it can to sequester and save the zinc in order to maintain essential functions. Protein behaves in the same way. So it's not a surprise because protein and zinc travel together and potassium is also found in many of the same tissues. So that's why the primary outcome of zinc deficiency is stunting. So when you have a low zinc intake, we already know that there's a reduction in fecal zinc, a reduction in the urinary zinc, and we also know that this exchangeable zinc pool decreases in size because more of the zinc is being sequestered over here in the tissues. We know now that there is a conservation of tissue zinc with very low uh, intakes, and we call this the triage theory. And what it means is that when there is a scarcity of zinc, homeostatic adjustments occur, altering the affinity of the binding proteins so that zinc is conserved for short-term survival, possibly at the expense of long-term health. So what we've started doing now is looking for markers of deterioration for long-term health. And what we have found is that oxidative damage to some of the cellular constituents increases when zinc is low. An example is DNA strand breaks. These are data from a study we completed a couple years ago, and we measured uh, the total strand breaks in a group of subjects who were eating a, a 12 milligrams of zinc a day at baseline. Then we put them on a low zinc diet, six milligrams, with phytate added so that they couldn't absorb that zinc very well, only for two weeks. What you see is the number of DNA strand breaks increased and that the increase was due to an increase in the oxidation of the DNA that led to the lesions. Only two weeks and this occurred. When we gave them a moderate zinc intake, immediately the DNA strand breaks were repaired and the reduction in oxidation occurred. And now we've started looking at some other metabolic aspects, markers of metabolic disease that may be sensitive to zinc intake. And one of the things we focused on is the essential fatty acid metabolism, because the key enzymes in metabolizing fatty acids is very zinc dependent and sensitive to very small changes in dietary zinc. And we have found, uh, as have others, that these shifts in the essential fatty acid metabolism are associated with an increased risk of diabetes and cardiovascular disease. It's interesting, in developing countries now, where the adults are on marginal zinc diets, we are seeing evidence of cardiovascular disease and diabetes occurring at around 40 to 50 years of age. Here's a, a picture of one of our subjects 
uh, who participated in the very low zinc diet. He was zinc deficient, and you see he has a rash over his face and his chest and his arms. And here is a picture of another individual who had essential fatty acid deficiency. The two sets of symptoms look very similar. So where does zinc deficiency occur worldwide? If we look at the red parts, it's where we have inadequate zinc intake along with stunting. And also there are other areas where there is stunting and probably the zinc intake is low as well. About a half a million children a year die related to zinc deficiency. And the causes of death are primarily due to diarrheal disease. Remember, zinc is required for normal immune function. But it's also been linked to an increased risk for malaria and respiratory changes, pneumonia. The lung and the membranes around the lung uh, require zinc, and so pneumonia is another a factor as well as maintaining the immune function. Africa has the highest rates of death, Asia about 40 percent, and the incidence in Latin America has declined to only about 3 percent now. So what is the World Health Organization recommending now, uh, in order to prevent uh, this degree of zinc deficiency? Well basically they've recommended that if a child has diarrhea to give that child, while they're giving oral rehydration therapy, which lasts for two weeks, to give them 20 milligrams of zinc a day at the same time to improve their zinc stores. But they are not making any recommendations for preventing zinc deficiency. So the only policy now for giving zinc is when a child has gotten diarrhea. What are so, some potential solutions that could be used? Well, we could give zinc supplements, try to give zinc supplements to those vulnerable populations. The cost would be appreciable given the number of people that would require it. And distributing them to the vulnerable groups all over the world would be a big challenge. The other thing that's under consideration is, well, why not fortify? We fortify our breakfast cereals. Why can't we fortify the breads and the cereals eaten in other countries? Again, the cost is significant, but the provision of the fortificant to low-income countries is a problem, and to get them to distribute the fortified foods to households is difficult. I'm currently doing a study in Ethiopia Ethiopia has decided to fortify wheat flour with zinc. However, there's only a small people, a small group of people that consume the wheat flour. Most of the people in the rural areas do not. So another way is to do biofortification. And this is to develop agricultural means to develop nutrient-rich seeds and fertilizers. So in other words, we can add zinc to the fertilizer or to the water when you're growing rice, maize, or wheat, and increase the zinc that way. And also, the seeds can be bred so that they contain more of the zinc. And we're doing a study now on biofortified wheat growing in Mexico that has twice as much zinc in it as regular wheat. And the other thing that could be done is to increase diet diversity in order to try to help people find a way to have a little bit of fish, have an egg a day, or maybe even once a week would be a step forward, and to reduce the phytate. And it's easy to reduce the phytate if the women know that they should soak their grains in water or they should leaven the bread. This will reduce the phytate and improve the zinc absorption. Whoops. My conclusions <laughs> first. Um, zinc deficiency affects about 2 billion people worldwide. It's associated with living on a cereal-based diet. The main consequences are stunting and infections. Uh, currently, we have no preventive programs in place. Uh, and one of the main problems is that we don't have a good sensitive indicator of the efficacy of the program. So that's why we're still working on trying to perfect the methods that we've been looking at, the DNA strand breaks or fatty acid metabolism. 
Thank you very much.